Hi, all. How are you? I, um, my name is Sean Jones, and I am uh, World Learning's uh, Senior Director for Corporate and Foundation Relations. Um, that essentially means that I work with um, our partners in the private sector um, on grant funded projects and other partnerships. Um, and today I will be presenting on um, how philanthropy um, can help um, enhance community impact. Um, I am going to focus on um, seeking money and prospecting for institutional grants um, from organizations like foundations and local corporations, because that's my area of expertise. But I'll try to kind of start with a bit of a bigger picture. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and share my screen. Sorry, it's gone a bit slow. Are folks able to see my screen, Hallie? Can you see it okay? Yes, I can see it. Great. All right. Um, so I've called this presentation fundraising for community impact. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the idea will be to kind of understand potential philanthropic stakeholders of your organization um, in general, um, and then um, we'll zoom into um, specifically how institutional funders, how, how you can win grants from and connect with institutional funders. I wanna try to um, show you guys some free and useful tools that are out there on the internet that you can um, immediately start deploying. And I also want to be sensitive to the fact that um, as international organizations, there are definitely some different challenges and dynamics at play compared to, say, a U.S.-based organization that's looking to raise money from U.S. foundation donors. Um, as part of that, um, for a lot of these talks, folks are interested in fiscal sponsorship. So I can do a final slide on um, what fiscal sponsorship is and how it can be helpful. Um, and this presentation is pretty quick, um, and I am definitely very open to having a conversation or answering questions um, at the end or during the presentation. So feel free to um, unmute, jump in, ask a question um, as I'm moving through. I'm more than happy to have a back and forth. Does that sound good? Great. Um, so, as I mentioned, I lead World Learning's Corporate and Foundation Partnership Program. Um, I've been doing that for more than eight years. Um, we have a three-member team, and essentially, we apply for um, private philanthropic grants and contracts um, on behalf of the organization. Um, we also build private sector partnerships into our government grant-funded projects. Um, beyond World Learning, I've had over 10 years of experience in institutional fundraising. I've worked with um, social service nonprofits in New York City as a consultant. Um, and with World Learning over the course of my time here, I've grown our foundation fundraising portfolio from um, something that was around middle six figure portfolio to um, a program that raises more than 3 million annually. So the main thing, so as a consultant, um, I would oftentimes meet with organizations that were looking to grow their institutional fundraising um, from either a very small program or as it pertains to a new initiative, etc. Um, and one of the big questions um, that often comes up is, is your program fundable? Um, we found that a lot of leaders of organizations would come to us as consultants and say, I need funding for my organization, um, you know, to make payroll because it's been a challenging year or because there's this plan for growth. Um, but I think there's an instinct, especially if you're a founder or an executive who really cares about your organization, um, to find funding for that. Um, the thing is, um, foundation funders, individual donors are increasingly thinking about funding a mission. Um, funding an impact 
and not necessarily funding an organization. Um, so we would always encourage um, our clients to prospect for programs, um, not for the organization. And beyond that, um, you need to think about whether or not your program is fundable and why it might be fundable um, by a certain donor, stakeholder, or foundation. Um, there's some great articles um, about nonprofit funding models in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, which I have linked here, um, which do a great job of describing um, how nonprofits earn revenue um, and what role charitable fundraising can play for those. And that's a really good place to start thinking about um, how to frame a program um, in a way that is fundable. Another thing to start thinking about um, if you've identified a program you want to raise funds for are the major thematic and impact areas of that work. Um, in this case, um, we're all thinking about STEM work. Um, there might be something more specific around STEM, like inclusion of girls and women in STEM, for example, um, and impact areas. The reason to start to think about and map out these areas is because this will be the core of your message to donors. And in the case of um, seeking foundation donors, um, it's going to be very important to identifying foundations who have a similar mission. It's also important to know what role a donor can play. Um, donors um, from individuals through to government donors don't want to just put some money into a big pot without understanding exactly what that money is doing. Um, so we also encourage clients to think about how donors specifically can help a certain program. Are they helping to fund innovation? Are they funding a gap to make a program more inclusive? Um, are they adding an important curriculum element um, to a program? Thinking about what is the specific impact a funder can have um, to get your program from A to B um, is, is really important to map out um, in advance of even thinking about outreach to donors. So a final step in kind of the pre-work to thinking about um, don't, who potential donors are is gathering comparable programs. Once you understand what your program's major thematic and impact area is, how specifically a donor can help. Um, it's nice to think about what other nonprofits are doing similar work um, in similar thematic areas and are working with donors in ways that you would like to work with donors. Um, that has some very specific benefits um, in doing prospecting for foundations, um, but it's also good to get a sense of kind of the tapestry of organizations working towards a common mission. Um, so you're able to articulate to donors exactly what your organization's unique role is. Any questions on that? All right, I'll move forward. Um, so after you have an idea of, of what your program is um, that you're looking for funding for, um, a, a good exercise to go into is stakeholder mapping. Um, so what that means is just thinking about the key individuals, organization, um, groups of people um, who are either beneficiaries, partners, community members, um, external donors who are in some way impacted by or feel meaning from um, the consequences of what your organization is doing. Um, and it's interesting to think very broadly about this. Um, some stakeholders are incredibly obvious. Um, if you're working with students, those students are stakeholders. Um, but some are not quite as obvious, and that can range from internal stakeholders, like your staff are incredible, incredibly important stakeholders, to more global stakeholders, such as international research organizations that are interested in kind of the consequences of impact of certain STEM best practices, for example. Um, so sitting down and thinking about primary, secondary, and more global stakeholders of your organization, um, as per this chart here, is a good way to start to define um, the 
surprisingly broad community of individuals and institutions that are impacted by your organization and thus might be impact interested in supporting your organization um, as individual donors, trustees, um, or partners. Um, these are just some examples of primary stakeholders um, who are directly affected um, by many organizations and secondary stakeholders. Um, something to think for think about for global organizations um, are research organizations, funders who are interested in particular geographic um, areas, countries or regions of the world, um, individuals who are just generally mission aligned um, with your organization, even though they might not know your organization, um, and corporates who might not have specific um, donor programs but might be impacted by the beneficiaries of your organization, for example, as potential employees. Does that all make sense? So I'll move on to focus specifically on institutional prospecting. Um, and these two steps are important for any sort of fundraising, but particularly important for institutional um, prospecting. So you'll have a program, you'll know what the thematic area is, you'll know the potential role of an organization, and perhaps you've done some big picture stakeholder mapping to understand what sort of partners and potential funder networks might be interested in your work. Um, from here, um, I encourage thinking about doing a very organized um, prospect researching um, process. Um, I encourage all organizations to use a tool. Um, for some, it, that's just an Excel document. Um, for some, there are more complicated um, client relationship management platforms. Um, and there are, there are basically two ways to start gathering prospects and logging them into your tool. Um, one, which I really think is the most important, is just generally getting knowledgeable about the field of philanthropy. Um, that means reading the philanthropic press, um, knowing trends, knowing when major philanthropic commitments are being made. Um, there are a lot of new commitments globally around um, STEM philanthropy. Um, and those are important trends to be aware of and um, oftentimes you know, include calls to action um, for reaching out to potential funders. I listed some names of good um, pieces of press to follow. Um, what I do is I, I don't use Twitter personally at all, um, but it is one of my best work tools. Um, I follow Twitter accounts of all of these publications, key funders, and it really helps me stay on top of when a new request for proposals is out or when a big philanthropic commitment is being made. There are also, aside from just knowing the industry, kind of some proactive steps you can take um, to start prospecting based on what you know about your program, your program's needs, and comparable organizations um, in your field. Um, one of the first things I recommend is just going to those comparable organizations' websites and seeing who is funding them. Um, it's a great way to start building a list of potential prospects. So what I would do is, you know, go to that site. They might have a page that lists their funders. I would log them all onto my prospect research tool for future research. Um, and then there's a couple free tools out there. I've listed GuideStar, Foundation Directory Online, and fund, fundsforngos.org, which is um, focused on international funders. Um, so that might be of particular use to you guys. Um, but there are also many other tools available. I can go into a couple um, right now. Um, so Foundation Directory Online is probably the most popular way, uh, tool for prospecting for foundation grants out there. I'm going to share my screen so you guys can take a look at it. Can you see Foundation Directory online on my screen now?
Assuming yes. Okay, good. Yes, we um, so foundation directory online. So this is a subscription service. Um, so world learning, for example, has a subscription to foundation directory. Um, but that said, it's pretty easy to find access for free. Um, you can make an individual account and have access to a limited amount of, um. Information, um, there are also a lot of public university libraries all around the world will have subscriptions to foundation directory online. Um, and finally, there are local foundation centers um, around the world. I mean, primarily in the US, um, but this is becoming an increasingly global platform. Um, so are, there are definitely avenues for getting access here. Essentially, what Foundation Directory Online does is allow you to search a database of all grants um, that have been made to organizations. Um, in the US, um, there is a law. Um, all philanthropic grant makers have to report their funding as part of their um, tax requirements. So all of that info becomes public knowledge. Um, so what I might do um, if I was looking for funding for World Learning's Experiment in International Living Program, that's a high school study abroad and exchange program. I would have thought about the thematic areas of cross-cultural understanding, exchange, and education, um, the role of a potential funder to provide scholarships, and based on that, locate an organization like Global Citizen Year, um, which is a very similar program to the experiment, raises money from a lot of private sector foundations for scholarships um, for a gap year programming. Um, so based on that, I highly recommend when using Foundation Directory to search based on comparable organizations as opposed to subject area, for example. This can be a bit wishy-washy in how foundations report what their subject areas are. Looking at specific grants awarded to comparable organizations is much more solid information in my mind. So this will allow you to search. Now you can scroll down. This will show all grant makers who've made grants to Global Citizen Year. What I'm really interested in is all of the grants Global Citizen Year has received. So I might go here, click view all. And as you can see, um, now I have a list of all recent grants um, made to this organization. Um, so, you can even, um, in some cases, click on the grant amounts to get specific description of what these grants are funding. So in this case, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation gave Global Citizen Year $2 million um, to empower diverse organizations to preserve ecologically and culturally important areas. Um, so that info is really good to have because it gives you a sense of grants that a grant maker uh, might make to your organization. So what I would do um, if I was doing some prospecting um, for philanthropic stakeholders is as I found foundations that were listed a lot that made relatively large grants, you can also search by grant size if you want. Um, I would start putting these onto my prospect worksheet kind of marking them for further research. Um, and soon, as you kind of learn about the purpose of grants, as you learn about funders that show up a lot, you're going to start to get a sense of who's in this community of funding around a specific mission area. And um, quickly, it's going to kind of become a small world of, of who the key stakeholders are. I'll stop sharing that for a minute. Um, actually, I'm just going to skip to one other under one other tool that is particularly useful for international work. So, in addition to searching for kind of specific grants um, awarded to specific comparable organizations and foundation directory, um, the same overall organization, which is now called Candid. Um, creates some subsets that basically pulls from the same data set in different ways. Um, one of my favorite 
sites to use um, that is kind of ancillary to foundation directory is called SDG funders. Um, that's the sustainable development goal funders.org. Essentially what this does is track grants towards advancing specific sustainable development goals in specific um, areas of the world. It's one of the best ways to search for funding in your country. So essentially, and this is a completely free website. You just go navigate and search to pull on this data. Um, I'm at SDG funders. Um, what you can do is search by your country. So let's say we want to search Guatemala. Um, so once you put in the country, it will show you the total amount of funding that has been tracked in the country. It's not perfect. Not everything is tracked. This is usually money that is derived from US sources, um, US registered charitable foundations. They're trying to expand it to become more inclusive than that. There's definitely some multilateral funding on here, for example, um, but um, it's not gonna be every penny of philanthropic dollars awarded by institutions. Um, as you can see, this is also organized by certain SDG areas from education, um, to health, etc. If I want to, I can even focus in on a specific goal. Um, so this is particularly education funding. And then, as you can see, um, so we are looking at education funding in Guatemala. The really key thing is it will show you all the top funders um, of education work in Guatemala. So this is a great tool for funders who are interested, finding funders interested in your geographic area. So when I saw this list, I would just put this down onto my prospect research tool, Templeton, Matiel Family, Tinker Foundation, Stone Family Foundation, definitely some organizations I recognize here as being active. Um, you can also see recipients if you're interested. Um, so these are the nonprofit organizations that are receiving funding from these foundations. Sometimes it's very obvious where the money is going. Like Templeton clearly gave a grant directly to University of Francisco Marroquin. Um, so yeah, another great tool that is out there. Any questions on that? I will dive back into the presentation. Okay, so now um, on your prospect research tool, um, you have identified your program. You know the role foundations want to play. You've been starting to build kind of a long list of potential foundation prospects, um, and perhaps you have been able to prioritize um, some particular foundations. Um, how would they be prioritized? Perhaps they've come up in a lot of different searches, like you saw on SDG funders that they were interested in your country. Um, some comparable organizations that you've searched in Foundation Directory Online have also received funding. The amount of the funding seem appropriate to your needs. Um, and perhaps you've seen recent news on this organization that they're, they're actively making grants. Um, so at that point, it's a good time to start kind of digging in. Um, um, so this is kind of a quick guide on how to focus in on a prospect and take the prerequisite steps to applying. Um, these, these steps are really important um, because in my experience working with philanthropic foundations, 90% of applicants to foundations will just go to their website, look at the rules for submitting a concept note and email it in um, without any other communication with that foundation. Now, in reality, the sometimes those Concept notes will get a response and lead to funding, um, but the large majority of cases, they're pretty much ignored. Um, that is because kind of in the 
especially the higher dollar philanthropic world, there are a lot of necessary prerequisite steps before just sending in a blind submission. Um, foundation officers expect you to be in touch with them, to have conversations, to preview your project, um, and to express like real deep knowledge of what that foundation's mission is. Um, so how do you position yourself to be among those few organizations that submit after really digging in? I think one of the first things um, that you can do is just get foundation funders acquainted with your program. Um, that used to mean like 10 years ago when I started doing this, it used to mean sending your annual reports you know, via regular snail mail to a foundation office um, so that the funders would have it available and would be able to page through it. That doesn't really happen anymore. Um, it is more about kind of thought leadership, networking, general social media, um, basically putting your organization out there um, as one that really cares um, about your thematic and impacts area of your key programs you wanna fundraise for. Um, that can mean having an active social media feed. It can mean being out there um, at conferences or events. Uh, hopefully we're back to that um, within the next year or so. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, it's just being active in the community. Um, foundations see themselves as part of a community of impact and practice around their key areas of work. Um, so it's important to make your organization a member of those communities as well. So from there, um, you want to really analyze the giving of your main prospects. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, a lot of larger foundations have websites that are quite transparent that show all of their grants. Um, so I say I encourage you to really take a close look at those websites. I like to read the news about our key foundation prospects. I have Google alerts on some of the key foundations we follow. Um, if it's hard to find info on a website, um, GuideStar is another really useful site. I'm not going to link to it here, um, but essentially it has the tax returns of all U.S. registered foundations, and on those tax returns, foundations are required to say who their leadership are. Um, it also says how much their leadership is paid. I always um, dangle that as a, as a fun reason to figure out, um, to check out GuideStar 990s um, of foundations. Um, but they also have to list all of the grants they've made. Um, so that's really important information um, to get to know not only who a foundation of interest is funding, but at what levels they're funding and what sort of requests would be appropriate. Um, finally, I encourage you to think about foundations not as kind of some monolithic entity um, that you're going to be sending a request to. It's a group of individuals who are really mission driven and it's incredibly important to know who those people are um, why they're in their job and how we can make their jobs easier um, as nonprofits who wish to partner with them. So to that end, I encourage you to research the individual foundation leaders. Um, that could be a director of a program, a program officer, in a STEM area, etc. cetera. Um, because when you do reach out to a foundation, you'll be reaching out to that person, um, not to a general address. After you start, doing some foundation on a website. Um, there's another great site that's linked here that I won't link to called Inside Philanthropy that has profiles on individual foundation leaders. Um, I'll look at LinkedIn profiles um, for connections perhaps with my organization. I'll Google them um, to see if they've been in recent interviews or have done any important research, et cetera. So from there, our process at World Learning is to create a whole prospect worksheet with all of this key information about the donor we want to get in touch with. Um, it'll also include a meeting prep packet um, that will prepare myself or our leadership to talk to the key program officer that we've identified. And only after all of that background research um, would we approach a foundation um, to inquire about a philanthropic grant. Um, just some keys here. Um, if you do find a connection in your research to a program officer, 
um, and try to be introduced through a connection as opposed to just reaching out cold. Um, and then the typical steps with philanthropic foundations is to reach out um, and ask for a call or a meeting, just a half hour conversation. Um, so as I say that one, one trap I see for people new to philanthropic outreach is they try to send a really long, complicated email pitching their entire program um, as their first piece of outreach to a program officer. Um, I encourage instead of that being very short and sweet to the point and think about the goal of your first email to a program officer being to get a call, not to get the grant. Um, there's kind of a series of steps. Um, and first, you just want to make that personal contact. Um, and, and as you reach out and as you have your call and get to know the program officer, um, one good way to think about it is that you're the program officer's ally um, in making their job easier. Program officers at foundations need to pitch a portfolio of programs to give grants to, usually to a board of directors. Um, so the more information you can give them, that's going to help them convince your, their board to fund you, um, the more helpful you're being. Um, so kind of with that knowledge, um, think about your conversation with the program officer as a chance to be curious about their priorities, um, to show that you and your staff are experts um, in your area of work or impact. Um, offer partnership and expertise. Um, oftentimes we're in touch with our program officers to introduce them to other funders, um, to share interesting articles about the STEM field, um, et cetera. Um, but then at the end of the day, don't leave that first conversation without making a specific ask. Um, some sort of reason to follow up. Can we share more information about our program? Can we share a concept note about how um, philanthropic stakeholders can help us, you know, take our STEM center to the next level? Um, some sort of deliverable is important because that's usually what program officers use to communicate with their leadership um, to move a grantee to the next level. And then, and then follow up. Um, and follow up shouldn't be just have you made a decision on our concept note, um, but kind of just sharing information about the field and kind of trying to cultivate that partnership. So only after that point um, would I recommend applying for funding. Um, and if you've done a good job approaching and getting to know a program officer and sending some background information, you'll probably find yourself in invited to apply for funding, which is really where you want to be. Um, sometimes that's not the case, though. Um, sometimes you'll just an RFP will come out after you've reached out to a foundation or they'll have a quarterly deadline and you'll ask the program officer that you met if it's an appropriate time for you to apply. I'm not going to get into how to write a philanthropic grant request or case for support in this presentation. That's like a whole course um, worth of information, um, but I have a link here um, to a great virtual course on how to write grant proposals. All right, so that is the end of my presentation on working out to um, individual or institutional donors. Um, this is just a final slide on fiscal sponsorship, um, just because it's one of the most common questions I've gotten in these presentations. Um, essentially what fiscal sponsorship is, is a way for international organizations to accept funding um, from US based donors, which include both individual and institutional donors um, in a way that those US based donors are able to get their tax advantages. Um, and um, essentially what needs to happen is the international organization needs to identify a fiscal sponsor who will accept the grants um, on the organization's behalf, handle all the administrative matters relating to um, making it compliant um, with the IRS 501c3 code, um, and then they will pass the money on to the recipient organization, usually after taking some sort of small fee. Um, there's a huge universe of fiscal sponsors and um, I'm not going to recommend any specific one um, because it really depends on what your needs are. Some fiscal sponsors are nothing but a bare bones pass through of funding. Others offer 
fundraising platforms like crowdfunding, um, a whole virtual back office, etc. Um, there is a link here um, to a whole directory of fiscal sponsors um, that work with international organizations for you to check out. Um, some examples of fiscal sponsors that specialize in working with global organizations are here. Um, global Giving um, is one of those organizations that offers you your own crowdsourced fundraising platform on their site in addition to accepting any corporate or individual donations on your organization's behalf. Um, global Impact is another really big global fiscal sponsor. And then there are also fiscal sponsors like Global Fund for Women um, that specialize in working with global organizations that are kind of more specific in their in their mission area or work, usually offering somewhat better kind of fee structures. Um, so if that is something you've thought about, how to accept um, international donations, this is definitely something to check out. And um, with that wraps up my presentation, but I am happy to answer any questions you all have about foundation prospecting, outreach, or, or anything else about philanthropy. And I will stop sharing my screen. If you have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself or just write something in the chat. I see one question here from earlier from Marbella about how often would you do this type of research um, for prospecting for donors? That's a good question. Um, we won't kind of start from scratch and kind of do the basic prospecting work, like going to foundation directory, creating a long list of prospects, and then kind of shortening it and reaching out to priority prospects. We won't do that on a weekly basis. It's more at World Learning kind of like a quarterly basis. Um, that is in part because we're managing an existing donor portfolio. And also, we get a lot of priority donors that kind of come in through our general following of philanthropic news um, and our and our knowledge of the landscape from having done this work for a long time. But even with that, um, we definitely will kind of go through that exercise of defining our key programs, defining the role of a foundation, and you know, getting into foundation directory, looking at other websites, and building those prospect lists um, at least several times a year. And it oftentimes leads to donations. Any other questions? Doesn't look like I see anything on the chat. Allie, if there's no other questions, I'm happy to pass along to you. Um, I'm also happy to share the presentation. So there's a lot of links on there, as you probably saw. So you guys can um, feel free to grab that PowerPoint, access the links. And um, my contact in info is also there. And I'm happy to answer questions you have um, after this presentation as well. <laughs>